My name is Pepe Santana. I was born in Ecuador, in the city of Ambato. I came to the United States when I was 21 years old. That is back in 1964. And uh, I was addicted to music at the age of eight. At that time, I used to visit communities whenever I could uh, and see the indigenous people playing music with very strange instruments, mostly flutes and pan pipes. And as a little kid, I used to build them out of cardboard and pretend that I was one of those musicians until the age when I began to realize that there was a special material that those instruments were made of and uh, I could begin to make some sounds, true sounds. At that time I was about eight years old. At the same time I was attracted to guitar playing. So music was all the time part of my life, part of what I wanted to do. <clears throat> Time went by and I learned a little bit of guitar, a little, a little bit of flutes and uh, I began to play music with my peers at school. We had little groups of music, but not so much uh, of the traditional sound of the natives, although they were with me all the time. As I grew up, as a teenager, the music became more attracted to me because I had things to learn from other cultures too. Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and I must admit, United States. Because when I was a teenager, I liked rock and roll. I'm talking about the Bill Haley and uh, uh, Chubby Checker and uh, uh, Elvis Presley, of course. And even that, I incurred, I, I went into that to learn. But within myself, I had my sounds. I felt happier when I played my music, I must admit. And then came the time when I came to the States. And I realized in New York, when I came to New York, that I could hear sounds from all over the world except the sounds from my land, from my side of the world, especially from the mountains. So that pushing me the idea that I should get into seriously, into that music, into the Andean sounds, because you couldn't hear that in New York. And after I learned about credit, that I could travel, you know, I went to Bolivia, Peru, other countries, and I got acquainted with more with their music. And not only with their music, but with the instrument making which attracted me very much. In several trips, I learned how to make some instruments, how to play them. And with some friends in New York, we organized a group that shared the idea of reproducing the traditional sounds of the Andes. Through the years, I have been digging more into the meaning, the functionality of this music. When I mean the functionality, I mean the, the way the music is used for dancing, for instance. So I, I got into that, not only learning the rhythms, not only learning the instruments, but learning some of the dancing too. And eventually, I began to develop 
uh, a program by which I could bring to schools, museums, libraries, or any educational facility this kind of music. And I must admit, it was not easy, but it was possible. So I did it. And I was being called by the schools, by the museums, to perform the music. In fact, one day I, it came to me the idea that I could do more and I was lucky to have a, in the audience the curator of the collection of musical instruments of the Natural History Museum. So he invited me to go and take a look at that collection. Little I know that this curator had in mind to create a whole of South American people at the museum. And he was planning in doing that. So the idea of getting exposed to his collection, or the museum's collection, I should say, was to be prepared. The idea was, the idea was to prepare something for that future hall that Dr. Morris was going to create. Dr. Morris, of course, is the creator, the curator. So one day, he says, could you record some music with these old instruments? I mean, instruments that were 2,000 years old, pan that were 1,500 years old. I said, okay, I can try it, I can, you know. So we did, and we made a tape. The hall was created, and the music that I record, if you go to visit the Museum of Natural History, the Hall of South American Peoples, you'll hear my music played constantly over there. So that gave me another idea that the elements of our culture have to be exposed in a special context to be appreciated better. Mm. So later on, it was the history of, or the tale of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, who was interested in an instrument from the Andean region. And I managed to donate a pan pipe called Rondador, made out of candor feathers. That was another instance of taking advantage of the opportunity to expose more elements of our culture. And later on, I met a lady who introduced me to other ways of expanding or uh, spreading Andean music. And that's how I began to perform for correctional facilities, for uh, women, for better, I mean, for shelters for better women, mm -hmm. and uh, for hospitals, uh, correctional facilities, I said that. But the idea was against to reach audiences, new audiences. <coughs> that perhaps never heard Andean sounds. By the way, this organization is called Music for All Seasons, based in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. They continue their work and they count on me whenever they can call me and, 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 and uh, invite me to play some place. I go, gladly go, because it's another opportunity for me tell about my music. That's an ongoing kind of thing. It has been ongoing for 25, almost 30 years. And uh, I have a word for, for my 
musician friends from the Andes. It's good to explore new ways, it's good to explore new propositions in music, like I have heard. Trying to play, for instance, jazz with other instruments may not sound good because the range of our notes don't permit that. But I know some people dare to do that. But don't forget, there is an element very important in our tradition that we don't want to disappear. It's very important for, for our DNA as Indians to preserve our culture, to preserve the elements, the roots of our culture, what we really are. And that's my task as a musician. I wish I could tell you more, but the time is limited. <laughs> Unless you have other questions, I would love to answer them now. I do have a question about your immigration to the United States and you said that it was difficult for you. So I'm wondering, and you came in the, in the 60s, so I'm wondering what the, I guess, the, um, how people perceived you and then also your music, if there's any instances where you felt like you were specifically discriminated against and if there were any other groups that uh, or other people were putting you into groups or categorizing your music and kind of making it seem like, you know, generalizing your specific culture and how you were able to, you know, I, you talk about the, the museum, I'm wondering what years those were as well and kind of how you were able to, you know, kind of like take a stand and be like, this is my, my music from Ecuador, you know, don't group me into other groups, which tends to happen when you're an immigrant, you're, you're grouped with other, with other countries sometimes. So I'm just curious about that okay. aspect. Back in 1964, it was possible to apply for a residence here in the States. There was not an immigration problem at that time. <clears throat> and uh, so I was product of that. I have no problem in becoming a resident, a permanent mm -hmm. resident here. When I talk about pushing ourselves as musicians, folk musicians, that is, and exposing our material to people and telling people that, I think it's a very important element to avoid discrimination. I am not too friendly with the idea of protesting discrimination for the sake of protesting. Mm -hmm. I am of the idea of doing something more positive than just protesting. And I think music can play a very important role in this regard. Of course I have seen people looking at me strange because I am from the Andes. But I can come around and show them that the same air, the same water that we have over there, we can have here and we can survive. It's not that the United States can offer us all the best opportunities in the world. It's not that part. It's the part that we can survive anywhere in the world and depends on us to push ourselves forward wherever we are, Africa, China, United States, Russia, wherever we are. If we don't push ourselves, if we don't move forward from that idea that we are being discriminated, we are not going to go anywhere and we will be all the time suffering. Music has offered me that opportunity to show people that we are humans with very specific values, human values, that we would love to share with the rest of the world. I don't know what else I can add to this, but that's basically my thought. Okay. And then within New Jersey, um, and you saw, you had talked to us earlier, 
you were talking about how you wanted to show other people who weren't who didn't know your culture but then you were also talking about how people from your own country were would say things like don't play this type of music and that made you want to create the festival that yeah. you created so could you talk a bit more about that sure there has been instances when when I go to a Latin American festival and I hear my music but for some people it's bothersome they don't like to hear because right away they identified as wrongly called Indian music uh, you have to remember that the Indian word is an accidental word that came with Christopher Columbus native people from the Andes don't like to be called Indians Call them natives, call them naturalists, so that's, that's, that's a more proper word. To call them Indians sounds, shows the ignorance of people. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't only apply for the Indians, it applies for the North American natives too. You call a uh, North American Indian, no, it's a native North American. To buy me. So that's the beginning when you begin with the semantic part of a conversation to deal with terminology, we have to be careful with that. We are natives, natives of the land. We are indigenous people, that sounds okay. So that's the part of the music also that has to be reflected. You know? uh, we may look Latin Americans or natives in the eyes of many Anglo-Saxons, for instance, I just mentioned Anglo-Saxons, to anybody, from anybody in the world. We may look Native Americans, but if we don't show what we are, really we are, we are losing, we are losing a lot, we are losing our identity right there. And we have to use our abilities, crafts, clothing, music, food, traditional celebrations, whatever, to show that we have a root, a cultural root. That's the only way we can come out and say, this is who you are. And this is what makes us respect you. So we expect something in return, and that's respect too. Does that somehow answer your question? Yes. Okay. And then could you talk about the festival that you would put on here in, in New Jersey? Okay. There was a moment when in performing, how do we project our music better? How, we, how do we portray better our culture? And it was back in 1978 when we had a group of musicians, Andean musicians. It was not going to be in, in, in a patronal celebration or, or in, in a high school. Or, we were having fun. At that time, I said, we, we have to aim higher. And we did. We had the first Andean festival in Alice Tony Hall, Lincoln Center in New York. It was so successful that hundreds of people couldn't come in. But it was the promotion, it was the idea of the Andean culture coming to New York. And it's not so easy to get there. Now, we didn't stop there. The following year, we did every Fisher Hall, a bigger hall. 700 people couldn't come in there. And we did it three years in a row. But then the venues became too expensive. And it was not possible to handle that. But we moved to other venues, like Symphony Space. The idea was to present the music in a context that people would appreciate it better. It was not a context of beer or food 
and screams, no. It was a context where people could really absorb what the culture meant with the music. So when those venues became too expensive to handle, and I moved to New Jersey, we started the Festival of the Andes at Waterloo Village in New Jersey. That was an open space, an ideal place to project Andean culture. So we created the Festi Andes, as we call it, where we had the stages for traditional music, for uh, mestizo music, more mixture, uh, for Panam music, different stages. So if you would come to this festival, you could choose what kind of music would appeal to you and learn from that. We also brought animals from the Andes, condors, llamas, vicuñas, alpacas, for kids to see. And we also had dancing, typical dancing, and foods. But everything had to be within the Andean context. Crafts, yes, lots of crafts. Nothing made in China or any other country. Everything had to be Andean. And the food, yes, the food, that was a very special, difficult thing to handle. Because all our food vendors had to wear gloves because the health department demanded them. Mm. And they had to have certain temperature for the cooking. All that had to be very carefully handled. Again, to put the whole idea of projecting the culture after learning what this country expected from us, so if the culture could be better appreciated and people would come back. In fact, they came back all the time. We started the festival in 1993 until 2006. By 2006, the Festival of the Andes was a gathering center for all the parents that had adopted Andean children. That's what they used to gather, because it was a good reference point for their little kids to go. So again, it's marvelous to work once we have uh, a concept to work with, but not just to work it casually, work it with conscience, work it with love, and the desire to be doing something good for your culture. You were talking about earlier how even and now you still, when you go to festivals, you don't find that same you know, thoughtfulness behind the festivals as you put into your own... Uh, could you repeat that? That you were talking about earlier how even now, you know, nowadays, you still don't find that thoughtfulness um, yeah. put into the festivals like you, you did with right. your own. Right. Uh, with certain... I'm not, I, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing Andeans for doing what they do. I know it's a big effort to put together a festival, to get permits, to get a performers, things like that. But I still don't see there is a, a the element of uh, how do you say refine mm -hmm. in, 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 in the uh, organizing these events. When, what I mean with that is that Fine, we are going to present this troupe of dancers, let's say, from Bolivia. Present the group, present the music, but don't put three groups to compete at the same time and you don't know what to hear or what to see. This is just one little detail. It can happen. I've seen it. We can do better than that. We can really uh, uh, polish that part of our presentations. That's just for the presentations. Now, the context, the music, 
fine. Are we going just to hear super modern uh, uh, alter fusionized and their music. What about the traditional music? There's no room for that. Why don't the festivals have a section where you could hear true traditional Andean music? Not just one type that represents the mestizo crowd. Where is the indigenous crowd? They still have their own elements. We don't do too much for that. We are more attracted to the techno cumbias, to the rock and rolls, to the reggaetons, but not to the indigenous part of it. The whole originated. The whole concept of Andean originated with the Andean, true Andean people, and we are not paying attention to that. So I guess we should work a little bit harder and do that. Do you think it's because they they believe that other people won't come to see, you know, the, the more traditional? You think it's out of fear of, you know, uh, what if we present it and it's rejected? Or is it just, la or just not, you know, trying hard enough or finding the right people to come and work with them? See, I think music <clears throat> is very entertaining. No doubt about that. But when you, play, when you put more elements to please the entertainment part of it, mm -hmm. instead of the cultural part of it, that's when we have the problem. You know, we, can, we can see just, I'm sorry to, to take the uh, example from Bolivia, a Suri dance. A Suri dance represents the movements of the Suri bird, which is the Andean ostrich. And it's all feathers, beautiful, created by the native people. That's one type of indigenous dance that's quite attractive, quite beautiful, and really projects what uh, the true Andean, Bolivian Andean is. If we put this kind of dance against another type of dance called caporales, which is really a bit. And then over here, the girls wear short skirts and all this thing. It's wonderful, it's a carnival kind of thing. It's beautiful. It's part of the, the, the cultural context today. It wasn't 50 years ago. No. Why the Suri dance is still active, active thing, but they don't show it. So this happens in Peru, in Ecuador, in Bolivia. We have to balance these things. It's not that this thing of caporales is wrong, no. I think it's wonderful. I enjoy seeing those things. But if you analyze the context of this part, you will see that brass bands didn't exist years ago. While the Suri dance of vampire music, yes. It existed, and today it's still there, but it's not paying so much attention. The colorful dance of the carnival of the Caporales is just marvelous, but it's more sexy. Mm -hmm. That's the part of it. Over here, the sexy part of it is the cultural aspect, the context, the purity of it, and it's still in existence. And we are not paying attention to that. This doesn't happen only in Bolivia. This happens in Chile. This happens in Argentina. This happens throughout the Andes. We are just putting aside the true traditional value. And we are jumping into the modern, contemporary, exciting mm. universe of exotism. Did you feel? Did you see when you were younger and and learning? Also, I actually actually wanted to ask you about that when you were learning and you said that you would go see the indigenous people um, and you'd go listen to them and when you started learning and learning how to make instruments, you were learning from the indigenous 
people in your community? Yes. Did you find that they were um, very accepting and, and, and excited to, to have you want to learn from them? Yeah, I tell you. One day when I was traveling through Peru, the first stop was Lima. And in Lima, I decided to go to the stadium to see the programs that they have of traditional mestizo uh, music to backstage to meet the musicians. I wanted to talk to the singers, to the to the musicians, and tell them that I, I was there to learn from them. Right? They got all excited. They got all excited. So, Jesus, we never saw anybody coming over here and telling us that they want to learn from us. Mm. And there was this lady who, who was a singer, you know, she was the most excited of all. When she went, came out to perform, she mentioned that to the public. I wish, she said, that over here we should appreciate our music better. But we have to have somebody from another country come over here and tell us that they love our music and they want to learn from us. Why don't you do the same thing? Learn from us, appreciate us. We don't have something to offer. I think that moved me. Mm. And the same thing happened in Bolivia. When I go, so play, they, they, they hear me playing my, my two flutes, the two signers from Ecuador. And they said, we never heard that. I said, okay, you are sharing yours with me, and let, let, let me share with you something. They do appreciate that. So they know they are moved when somebody listens to it. And I tell you one thing that's quite fascinating, and I have told a few times. The only musicians that come to the United States, perhaps looking forward to collect a dollar for playing on the streets, because that's the, that's a big deal. You know, I have seen the only musicians making a bundle of money here. They don't realize that the people from the United States that have traveled through the Andes, they have learned. They have learned, they have, they have seen the difference between what is traditional, mestizo and contemporary music. Traditional being the indigenous people. Usually they play the music with winds and percussion instruments only no strings. The mestizo includes the strings. And the contemporary includes the electronics on top of everything. So we have to establish that difference. The North American knows that. The North America that has trouble. But the only musicians that come over here and try to convince the people on the streets that that is the music original from them. They laugh at it. But they are so gorgeous, that's the, the North American tourists, that they don't tell them anything. They know right away this guy is trying to overcome something. Mm. It's sad, for me it's sad to see that an Ecuadorian group goes to play in the squares of Norway, one city in Norway, I saw that. And they are dressed like Native Americans from North America with their feathers and everything. And they are playing Ecuadorian music, mestizo music, of course. Plus the electronics, you know, it's terrible. You go over there and they are trying to exploit and think that people are ignorant. They are, going to, they are not going to see the difference. They see the difference. These musicians, they don't understand. The world could be ignorant, but not that ignorant. Mm -hmm. you know? When I saw them, I approached them and said, why do you wear the feathers? You are from Ecuador. Oh, <coughs> because they are attractive and they, 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 people like it. No, that, that's not the justification. So these little elements, we should learn how to polish. We should learn how to file down we could do better.
And it, it also starts with the musicians who are playing. If they don't respect the music, how can they, you know, expect when they present the music to others for them to respect it as well? If they're learn, learn. It's not a matter of playing a flute. Hmm. You have to learn what they play. It's not just being so expert in one kind of an instrument mm. and won't be able to say what is the tradition of that instrument or the music that they are playing. Being able to explain what you do, that's important. Because you can just listen and that's it. No. I believe that we should play for people to listen and retain something from what they listen. That's the important part. Like in your performance that I saw, and how you took your time to explain everything and allow people to touch the instrument. That's the idea. I mean, every culture has its, can have its own pedagogical way of telling people something that they, they will remember. That's the important part. Hmm. They will remember. It's not the idea of, I heard this beautiful tone, but behind that tone, I had, this tone is played by the natives of Bolivia, the natives of Peru, at least the part, if nothing else. Because each musical piece, especially traditional, has a, a background. You know, could be music that was playing a celebration of who knows, potato planting, who knows, uh, the, the tussling of llamas. Perhaps that music has to have, the music has to have a little tail in order to have an impact. It's my belief. Yeah. And when you do your shows and your workshops, how do you choose which instruments to highlight? Or does it change depending on the audience? How many instruments? How do you choose which instruments to highlight, like you did in your performances or even in your workshops? And does it ch does the instrument you instruments that you show change depending on who it is that you're you're showing them to? I still don't get the question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that um, when you're performing, you show instruments. Yes. And I'm just wondering. Um, do you have a reason for which you, for why you highlight certain instruments, or uh, does it yes. differentiate uh, yes, depending on I, the audience? The idea is that <clears throat> when I pick up an instrument and you listen to it, the first thing you, you hear the sound that's an interesting sound. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of a material is that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you are a musician, what kind of a scale of Oh, uh, the instrument has. You know, how is it made out? When you see the material, could be cane, could be wood, could be stone, could be bone. Then, if you explain that, people gets involved with your performance, mm -hmm. and you begin to learn. You know, uh, the drums, you have to pick up a drum. What kind of drum is this? It's a handmade drum. Fine. What kind of skin do they use? The head drums. Goat skin with one hair on side, hairless on the other side, produce two different tones. The performers don't do that anymore. They assume you know it all. But that's not so. But if you are listening and performing this strange music and you explain a little bit more, I think it's a better way to dialogue with people. It's a better way to respect their intelligence too. Hmm. And to get them more curious, you know, once you've explained one instrument, you want to keep knowing, you know, more instruments that you're playing. Keeps the curiosity alive while, while watching you as well, you know. They must be thinking more things. Yeah. <clears throat> I find that in every presentation that I have individually, People want more. Hmm. After I finish my presentation, people want to know. Oh, that's strange. How many strings do I have? You know, how was the ring? How do you combine two instruments? How do you do it? How is that accomplished? Hmm. You know, and few performers share that. Very few performers. 
and this became like the trademark of my performances. I may talk half of the time and play half of the other time, but there is a purpose for that. In this case, it's not just the cultural aspect of it. It's the practicality of performing. You want people, you want to grasp, grasp the attention of people, and you have to devise a way of doing it. Mm. And my way of doing it is just explaining what the instrument is like. Made out of clay, what does the name mean? Mm. Where does the instrument come from? What is the metamorphosis of that instrument? How come it once had two holes and then ten holes? You know, we have to we have to reach more that way. And if we use our culture as a backdrop, mm. that's a plus. Definitely. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your group. Uh, the, the group? Yeah, Inkai. Inkai, yeah. in the formation of the group. When I came to the States, as I mentioned before, it was fascinating to hear the sounds of other countries. That forced me to find a way to look for musicians that would help me create a group. And we did create a quartet. That's back in 1969 or so. It was voices and strings. But playing and their music. When I said just the strings, obviously it had to be in some music. It was not the traditional music. But it was a beginning. Uh, the group was called Los Andinos, the Andeans, and we became very popular. We reached the television, and uh, I mean, with the time of Mirta Silva and Bobby Capone, at that time, they invited us to their shows. She was from Puerto Rico, right? Mirta Silva. And she said, okay, I have to bring you to Puerto Rico. We can make a tour of Puerto Rico. But two of the guys in the group were married. Uh, there was a problem there. Their wives didn't want to release them mm -hmm. to do something like that. And that was virtually the end of the group. We couldn't go any farther. For uh, up to that point, most of our performances didn't give us the money we wanted. We just wanted to be acknowledged, to, to, to be known, like uh, Andy musicians. The time went by and I made a group uh, of uh, young, two young girls and a, a guy from Peru, and we created a group. Then so we began to play Andy music. The group was called Tawantin Suyo. Tawantin Suyo was born at that time. And uh, that lasted with Tawantin Suyo is when we reached the first festival of the Andes in Lincoln Center. Uh, but things again went up and down. And like anything of this kind comes in, fades out. Mm -hmm. That was one. Well. Then when I started doing things on my own, until I met, until I met uh, around 1984, precisely for the flute caravan that I mentioned before, I had to create a group. That's how Inkai was born. And then we were two Ecuadorians and two Bolivians at that time. After two years of touring, the group again began to grow. We began again to, to do the theaters in New York, big, big venues, you know, like the Symphony Space, Lincoln Center. And then the Bolivians disappeared. And then I found 
the Equ to more Ecuadorians. That's the group we have now. We all are Ecuadorians. And uh, they are excellent musicians. And they share. Each one of us have our own professions. We don't really depend on the music to survive. And, uh, but when we gather and play music, we do it with good intentions. Not with the idea of making money. When I said the good intention is to really work hard on the traditional aspect of, of, of the culture. Yes. Anything? Any follow That's up? a lot. That is. I just wanted to ask maybe just a, a real quick back to the basics question of um, if you could just talk a little bit about the different, what are the different um, genres of music that you play and the instruments? The different? The zif different genres of music? Yes. And the different types of instruments? Oh, <clears throat> okay. The music from the Andes, basically from Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, I concentrate on those three countries because geographically they have been isolated. Bolivia doesn't have sea to start with. And Peru and Ecuador are on the Pacific coast. So in the past it was difficult to get to these countries. And that gives us the idea of the cultural influence from Europe especially was not so marked. So we, we have managed to preserve in those three countries lots of the traditional music. And each country has its own characteristics, rhythmically and instrumentally. Yeah. For instance, in Ecuador the pan pipes are small. As you go south to Peru, they begin to be larger. In Bolivia, the pan pipes are very large. The same thing with the flutes. There's a difference between a, pan, a flute and a whistle, for instance. In the wind instruments, the main categories are whistles, flutes, and pan pipes. Right? So, <clears throat> Pan pipes, let's say in Bolivia, let's pick up one, one type of pan pipe, a pan pipe called hula hula, that is used during the traditional celebration of the Tinkus, which is an encounter of communities when they want to, uh, to get even for any problem water problems or so, they get them you know, and they fight or whatever. Then the hula hulas, the pan pipe hula hulas can be heard. It's a specific music for that specific event. See that? Or oh, when you have the tarkas, which is a whistle made out of wood. It's a carnival type of song. The Tarkas are a carnival song, usually playing in Monday, February, whenever carnival is celebrated there. So it's a specific type of instrument used in a specific <coughs> type of celebration. It's the same thing in Peru. They have for certain celebrations certain kind of instrument, certain kind of rhythm. This is talking about the indigenous type of music. Because the mestizo has another type of things. Yeah. In Ecuador, it's the same thing. In Ecuador, whenever we have a, let's say, indigenous celebration, acculturation brought for them to the celebration of Corpus Christi, which is not an indigenous celebration, really. But they have to use a special instrument, a whistle called pinculio. Pinculio, pinculio is a type of whistle similar to the tabor pipe that is used in England. 
spread with one hand and with the drum at the same time. Specifically for Danzantes. Danzantes is the dance. So we have that in the Andes. I mean, players and the musicians, they have to understand this. Culture, we have so many beautiful things to tell people. And we must, we must get into that. Study a little bit, it's not hard. Study it and, and you become fascinated by what do we really have. I have mentioned the Danzantes from Ecuador and the, the rhythms that are created with the drum and the whistle. In my experience, whenever a jazz musician listens to the indigenous rhythm that we ignore in our countries, the jazz musicians admire the kind of syncopation that can be made with that kind of, of a drum in a danzante from Ecuador. I mean, if you are exposed to Middle Eastern sounds and percussions, you will see what I'm talking about. They have nothing to do with the regular beat of the techno cumbia or a reggaeton, no. They have something that is different than what we hear ordinarily. So each rhythm, each sound, each instrument has a specific use in traditional music. Now, if we move to the mestizo aspect of it, oh, we will have a whole array of special instruments used for caporales, used for tinkus. No, no, tinkus, I wouldn't say that, that's very typical indigenous. Oh, the habladas in Bolivia, things like that. They use a specific rhythm for that. And the dance has to be specific to that rhythm. Yes. And my la I have one last question. Do you have a favorite instrument? A favorite instrument. A favorite. Do you have a favorite to play? Yes. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the string instruments. My favorite string instrument is uh, a Peruvian bandurria. Uh, uh, let me show you what, what the bandurria looks like. This is a bandurria. It's a 20 string, 20 string instruments has four sets of five strings each, which means that in order to play one note, I would have to press five strings. This is my favorite instrument that unfortunately is out of tune because <laughs> it's hanging on the wall and I cannot play. That's the string instrument. Now, the wind instrument, my favorite wind instrument, is the, let's see, kind of table pipe, it's called Pingulio in Ecuador. And uh, in Peru they call it Pito also. In Bolivia they call it Waka Tinti, Waka Pinti, it changes the name, but it's a structurally the same instrument. It has only three orifices, two on top and one underneath. And of course has to be played together with the drum. Yeah. I have more questions. This came to mind. <laughs> where, do you, where do you see Andean music for the future? From this point on, after you may retire from this at some oh, point, and you say, beautiful question, beautiful question. Well, things 
I, I believe that things could be cyclical. They could go around. Uh, I do hope that by paying better attention to the traditional music, we can really rescue the values and the elements of the traditional music, and the music. What, I, what do I mean with that? When you go to the countryside in the Andes <clears throat> and you hear a, a musical instrument, as a musician, you know that it's out of tune. It's not out of tune. It's not, it's not tuned, the instrument is not tuned. If we, as musicians, can approach the earlier musician and tell him, perhaps if you move a little bit this note, the melody might be more appealing. But then you think you might be losing the real true value of it because the attractive part is the out of tune music. But that's not what I'm talking about. Let's pick up the tarka, for instance, which is uh, the, the, the carnival instrument I was talking about before. It plays the, the melody in one key, and the other one that is larger plays the same melody in another key. So parallel they are going there. But if one of them is out of tune, you won't be able to notice it because of the parallel element that exists there. And I believe, uh, this is my belief, it's so properly as well as the other one. It may sound better, but it hasn't lost the, the original the structure of that harmony. You follow what I mean? So perhaps in the future we can work out that. Let's say, talking about this one, how do you make a pingulio? You take a six hole flute, or whistle, a six hole, and you keep, you close all these four holes and you keep these two holes. The third hole will be here. Now it's underneath. Then you will have this kind of instrument, right? But when you want to make a scale, you may not get it properly in order to create the melody that you want. is not the way you expect. You have to modify it, move the holes or so. So the ones who made this kind of instrument should be aware of that. And we as musicians can point that out to the other musicians. Why don't you move this hole a little bit lower so it could be more into, into tune. You are not losing the way you're going to play your melody, but your melody may sound more more palatable, perhaps, I don't know to say that. But again, you risk the fact that you may lose it. that roughness that sometimes these instruments have. So there is hope that perhaps in order to make the music more palatable, we may have to risk a little bit of the true tradition of it.